I'm Dr. Scott Lyons, and you're watching or listening to The Gently Used Human. Ever stared down the barrel of a kale smoothie straw and thought, is this it? The elixir of life? Or is it some other superfood or some other super vitamin? And how do I stay young forever or older for longer? Well, you're in luck. In today's episode, we dive into the depths of the famed Blue Zones with none other than the explorer of longevity, Dan Butner. We explore the vibrant lives of superagers and unearth the not-so-secret sauces of purpose, faith, and community that appear to add an additional decade of healthful living. What is it about these specific locations that sparkles with the magic of extended vitality? And can we bottle it? in a smoothie? Listen in as Dan reveals the accessible secrets of longevity and points us towards a future where we might just manufacture our own blue zones right here in the throbbing hearts of our own neighborhoods. Dan Butner is a National Geographic Fellow, New York Times bestselling author and discoverer of the blue zones, the unique region where people live extraordinarily long, healthy lives. Through the Blue Zones projects, he collaborates with cities and companies to promote well-being, impacting over 5 million Americans. His latest book, The Blue Zones, Secrets for Longer Living, delves deeper into these regions, secrets to longevity, even unveiling a man-made blue zone. And if that isn't impressive enough, Butler also holds three genius world records in distance cycling. Welcome to the gently used exploration of a vibrant life. Dan, welcome to the Gently Used Human. We're so excited to have you. I, I have to say, I watched the documentaries. I, I read the books. I wanted to be a skeptic. I wanted to just be like, no. And you won me over. You, yeah. you just... <laughs> you I'm won sure my we'll get heart. around to some gentle torment, but I appreciate <laughs> the opening here. <laughs> Dad, I, I truly I like had some tears. I was like... Fuck you! You just totally melted my heart with with oh, all that you're doing. Thank you. I'm really excited to just dive into your work and and all the incredible things you're offering in this world right now. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, like every overnight success, it's taken me 20 years, and uh, <laughs> literally, I feel like I, I feel incredibly lucky. Well, of course, it was. The harder you work, the luckier you get. But yeah, this is my this is my week. You know, the the the, the Netflix has been number one, or it's still the top five in the yeah. nation, but biggest show, uh, uh, living to a hundred. And I just found out that Blue Zone Secret to Living Logger, my book, uh, made the New York Times best selling list yesterday. I saw that. Congratulations. The, you know, those are all major wins. I mean, yeah. it's not what life is about. I, I'm a much bigger believer that. That you have to enjoy the journey, and then get too wrapped up in the in the in the outcome. But the outcome feels really good right now, and, and you know, I, and and, and I, I I've arrived. I'm I, I'm on the gently used human podcast. So <laughs> just, I've, I've hit the pinnacle. Now you know you you know New York Times that list. Fuck it, you have reached the pinnacle yeah, on the gently yeah, used so human. I'm, I'm gonna dance. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dad, we're gonna get into this, but you. I'm going to say this as as a, a great compliment. I believe you have single handedly raised the life expectancy, and I, I, I'm like, at what point have you had an opportunity to pause, soak that in, and recognize you have made a significant change in this world? Well, thank you for saying that. I probably I haven't yet sat sat by and paused you know you know we as minnesotans we're we're, we're a self-deprecating apologetic bunch well god and, i'm uh, sorry about that you know self-congratulations you know puts you in the in the doghouse with your neighbors so you know we're true. we're you know when 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 we're having a good day in minnesota we say it's not too bad <laughs> and the presupposition is life is bad and hard and yeah. The tall tree gets chopped down. So, but in all honesty, I know my work is important. And I know, you know, especially I, my daytime job creating these Blue Zone Project Cities, I know Gallup has measured that we've saved millions of life years, they call yeah. it. So added many millions of years of life expectancy 
by taking this approach. And I'm proud of that. I really am. Yeah. But, you know, I, the, I'm continuing to keep my head down and focus on the work. Such, you have such a sweet Minnesota humbleness. And uh, I, I do, <laughs> for those who can't see, there's, there's a beautiful, sweet gesture <laughs> happening across the screen for me right now. <laughs> that only a true Minnesotan can make. I, I hope you get an opportunity to, to soak it all in. I know it's, it's also fresh, just even in getting the New York Times yesterday, yet again, for the, what is this, the sixth time? Fifth. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's still a big deal every time. You never know. My last two books didn't make it, so I was, felt like I, I was losing my mojo. Mm. This, this one's back on. Well, congratulations for just reaffirming your mojo, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the next book, Reaffirming Mojo. That's actually my next book, so back off, Dan. Oops, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in the world today where we are seeing hurricanes cascading across California, fires, and, and all the impact that, you know, that we have done on the environment... You know, and humans are known for shaping the environment as we see it now. But how has, how is the environment been really shaping us as humans? Yeah. Well, there's a couple of types of environment. We we think of environmentally friendly behavior as one type. The type of environment I think of is the environment that we create around us, how we how we engineer our surroundings is probably a better way to think about it. This took me 15 years to realize, but in blue zones, they don't pursue health in the way yeah. we pursue health. We in America, we think, okay, we're unhealthy, we're overweight. We're going to get healthy by finding the right diet, the right exercise program, the right supplement regimen, and we're going to stick to it. We're going to get on and stick to it. And of course, it never works. It fails for 97% of people who try diets and try exercise programs. In blue zones, longevity is not pursued, it rather ensues. It is a mm. product of their environment. So they're eating mostly a whole food plant-based diet because the cheapest, most accessible and most delicious foods are simple peasant foods like beans and grains and garden vegetables and tubers. They they're moving constantly, not because they're remembering to go to the gym, but because every time they go to work or a friend's house or out to eat, it occasions a walk. They have gardens out back. So they're every day weeding or watering or harvesting or planting. Uh, they don't have mechanical conveniences. Uh, loneliness, which is an epidemic in this country, is not a problem in blue zones because it's impossible to be alone. You know, every time you walk in the street, you're bumping into your neighbors and you're expected to show up to village festivals or show up at church. You know, this is all environment. This is not something that they're mustering discipline for presence of mind. It, it comes with their surroundings. Yeah. So maybe we can back up just a moment and, and give uh, the audience who may not know what a blue zone is. You know, the, the five people who haven't read your book or your documentary this <laughs> week, seen your documentary this week, what is a blue zone? Or as I like to call it, a turquoise zone. Yeah, <laughs> it's a shade of blue, right? <laughs> it well, it's a, um, it began with, a, with a, a project I did with National Geographic to reverse engineer longevity. Yeah. So instead of trying to find uh, a secret or lessons for living longer in a Petri dish or, or a, a test tube or some sort of a genetic manipulation. We decided to find places where people have achieved the health outcomes we want, which is making it into their 90s or 100 without chronic disease. And uh, we know that only about 20% of how long you live is dictated by your genes. The other 80% is something else. So we began working with demographers, and, and these are people who study populations, and they're able to, to do the calculations to determine, and it's a huge project because we had to par, parse worldwide census data to find the longest of populations on Earth. And once you find them, and by the way, a lot of places that were sort of self-promoting or thought to be long-lived areas have been debunked. Oh. So we really did the work to make sure that people are living as long as 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 they think they are, 
among the longest. Once we find those places and then look for the common denominators, what are they all doing that, what are all these places do, that who are making it to age 90 and 100 without disease? What are the common denominators? And from there, you start to distill very clear trends and to distill very clear lessons that the rest of us should be following. And most of my books, various degrees of detail, show how and why these people are living so long. But to your question, what are blue zones? These are the places. Hmm. Okinawa, Japan, longest lived women in the world. Sardinia, Italy, longest lived men in the world. Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica. They have the lowest rate of middle-aged mortality in the world. So middle guys our age, Scott, have about a two and a half fold better chance of reaching a healthy age 90, 95 or so. And they do it spending one fifteenth the amount we do on health care. In Korea, Greece, eight extra years of life expectancy, no dementia on that island. And then finally, in the United States, I'm on the Seventh-day Adventist in Loma Linda, California. We have an American group of American subculture living about seven years longer than their California counterparts. So what are these people all doing in common and what can we learn from them? That is Blue Zones. Mm. And, and who is responsible for creating the Blue Zone or the creation of the Blue Zone? Is it individuals? Is it a community? Is it just happenstance? Well, I'm going to answer that two ways. The, the original Blue Zones, except for one of them, I identified them or named them. Yeah. Uh, the original Blue Zone in Sardinia was actually coined by Gianni Pass. The other four were, 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 were my doing. But Sardinia is one of the one of the blue zones, and these evolved over time. In, in much of you've heard the term natural selection. This is sort of a natural selection of a society that it seems that the characteristics that favors the well being of people have survived and been perfected over the generations. Their diet and their their ecosystem is just help, we know helps people thrive. So. They evolved. Now, my daytime job for the past 20 years has been manufacturing blue zones, and we've done 72 of them in America. And, and those have come about as a result of political will, adopting policies that favor healthy food and more movement and uh, greater well-being over necessarily just business interests. And then the effort of critical mass of restaurants, grocery stores, workplaces, schools, and churches who agreed to optimize their policies and designs so that the healthy choice is the easy choice. And then 15% or so of individuals who become Blue Zone ambassadors. And if we can orchestrate that people, places, and policy initiative and sustain it for five years, we find we manufacture a Blue Zone. In other words, According to Gallup, every time we're able to do that, we see the obesity rates drop, we see chronic disease rates drop, and we see healthcare costs drop. Meanwhile, people report higher levels of life satisfaction. I think that's an important piece. We, I mean, everything what you said is important. You know, the the piece around life expect the the progression of life expectancy and that it's enjoyable. Because I, I, I think that a lot of people are afraid of getting older. I mean, in fact, I, I've worked with teenagers that are afraid of getting older with these ideas of what it means. And, you know, I think that there's a real process of... That zipper noise was Dan taking off his clothes, everyone. <laughs> I just want to be... <laughs> he was getting hot and bothered by my next yeah, question. Yeah, I find that bottomless uh, <laughs> interviews go over better. I do too. That that is also a blue zone, but we won't talk about that on this episode. Yeah, <laughs> or currently, we, or we might. Who knows? Huh. <laughs> you know, like it, there's a real process of of shifting the perception of what it is to get older, and that there's there's there can still be enjoyment and meaning and excitement as we age. Well, that, you know, that's the big point. I, I, I'm generally critical of the whole anti-aging movement in America, mm -hmm. longevity hacks, these Silicon Valley billionaires 
taking these very experimental drugs like rapamycin or off-label metformin, shooting themselves up with younger people's blood. These aren't fun ways to pursue longevity. And by the way, we don't even know if they work in humans. And if they work in humans, maybe they give us a year or two of extra life expectancy. The blue zone approach, we found real people, human beings with the same genetic constitution more or less that you and you and me and everybody listening right now, living about 10 to 14 years longer than the rest of us. And, and they're getting this by being socially connected, hmm. by knowing their sense of purpose and not being existentially stressed out about you know, what their place is in the world, eating delicious, healthy food and feeling good because of it building community. These are all things that there's a mountain of evidence underpinning them when it comes to adding years of good life that not only help us reach the capacity of our bodies, but do so in a way that the journey is enjoyable, yeah. fulfilling and rich and, and, and full of life satisfaction and positive feelings. And until this week, it wasn't sexy because I have nothing to sell you. I don't have a pill. I don't have a supplement. I don't have, you know, some cheesy program to sell you. I just tell you what the world's longest of people. It's, it's not a quick fix, but there is a clear path. And the clear path mostly has to do with changing your surroundings. Instead of trying to change your behavior, which is a failure for almost all the people, almost all the time. And I challenge anybody to show me data of any behavior modification program that works for more than single digit percentage of people after two years. Remember, when it comes to longevity, yeah. they have to be things you're gonna do for decades, not just a couple months or years. So shaping your surroundings so our unconscious choices are better throughout the day. That's the secret. And if you focus on that, you can get it done. I want to take a moment to give a loud shout out to the Embody Lab, which is oh, one of the most incredible resources for body-based and somatic therapies. This show is all about healing, and the Embody Lab does exactly that. Whether you're on your own journey of transformation and discovery, or enhancing your skill sets in your career as like a coach or a therapist, a body worker, or really any career where you are supporting other gently used humans, the Embody Lab is your place for deep, inspiring and impactful workshops, certificates, master classes, and an incredible community of like-minded folks. I love the Embody Lab, and so do so many other people that call it a platform to come home to over and over again. The Embody Lab is giving my listeners an exclusive offer, a one-time 10% off code to enhance your embodied well-being. All you have to do is go to theembodylab.com and use the code GENTLYUSE10 at checkout. I like that it doesn't feel so overwhelming to me. Like when, when we look at all the, the biohacking and when you dive into all these complex nutritional programs and stuff like that, it, it as a someone, I mean, I, I'm relatively educated. I've done, a, I've done a school or two. I find it overwhelming. And one of the things I found in reading your book and in the documentary was I'm like, I don't feel overwhelmed. Well, let me just say the only time I felt a little overwhelmed is when the suggestion would be that I might have to live uh, with or near my family. But (laughs) other than that, no, but the, the, it just was like, here's, it's clearly laid out. It doesn't rest solely on the individual. I mean, meaning that like, we're, I'm doing this in community, I'm building community, I'm doing this in community, and that has an impact. It's not all on like, I have to wake up at 7am every day, and take all these vitamins, and then do four hours of meditation and yoga, and then exercise, etc. That's exactly right. Yeah, so I just wanted to say, I know you're not, you don't have that special thing that you're selling and hasn't been sexy, but accessibility is sexy, Dan. 
Uh, it sounds like something we should put on a T-shirt. <laughs> we oh, we have a whole merch line. Don't you worry. Yeah, accessibility, <laughs> sexy, and gentle torment. <laughs> Two taglines from the gently used human <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so, what is your favorite blue zone? I like the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica for a vacation. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nosara is a nice place. It's not a real blue zone, but it's close to the blue zone. My favorite is I- Icaria, Greece. I stay at Thea's guest house at Nos, which is right in the white or the you know the blue bullseye of the blue zone there. Nice. And uh, it's right on the Aegean Sea, and it's it's the, I think the best way to get a feel for what. It, it's not a place to go get a spa like vacation and with massages and so forth. But you know you're more likely to end up. You know, working, helping work in somebody's garden or pick grapes for a neighbor, but it's a real blue zone, do, and it, it's worth it's worth experiencing once in your life. If I go there on vacation, do I add a few days to my life expectancy? You know, all joking aside, probably, and I'll tell you yeah. why. Yeah. Because you'll get a chance to feel what it's like to live in a, mm. in a blue zone. You will. The food you eat will be mostly whole food, plant based. Uh, most of the time when you travel to point A to point B, it'll be on foot. Mm-hmm. You'll witness a type of social interaction that you'll crave and perhaps seek when you get home. Mm-hmm. You'll see a population whose life is suffused with purpose mm-hmm. and maybe want to find more of that your, yourself. I mean, it's it's the first step on a journey to living longer. Mm. Yeah, I know exactly. I've accidentally lived and or visited several of the blue zones before I, I knew what they were. I lived in Costa Rica. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and it, there is. I like didn't know what it was. I was like, maybe it's just the air is better. But the, but I, I, I think, like, you know, each of us, have, we can now say, have spent some time in blue zones. And like I, I'm curious from like the subjective embodied experience, how do you, ex- how do you feel it when you're there? Well, when you when you first get there, it's uncomfortable. You realize, wait, there's no real obvious comforts here, and it's kind of dirty. You know, and there's no, nobody's advertising longevity. It's usually found in people's homes, and it takes a few it takes a few days to slow down and acclimate and and start to open your eyes to to what you're seeing. But I find you sleep better. Hmm tend to wake up with the sun mm-hmm. and uh, not not except for party you know village party nights people don't stay up that late you know not much happens after the sun goes down except baby making <laughs> and uh, uh, and sleep cue zipper noise again <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> Beautiful, Dan. Not not only are you an award winning author and documentary maker, but you're an incredible sound maker. There you go. <laughs> On cue. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I I I did sleep better when I lived there. I also was quote unquote less efficient in my work. I remember I went back down there to write a book, and I wrote one page in a month, and I was like, oh no. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't because I was distracted. It was, I just kept saying to myself, I feel like I'm living more and this isn't how I want to live right now by <laughs> writing a book. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, it, book writing isn't maybe as important as we think it is. And no. I, I would definitely say in Blue Zones, it's this, this kind of artifice of success or fame or status or financial freedom it's just not a motivator as it is here yeah it's almost a fiction that if we achieve those things work really hard and achieve those things that are the definition of success we'll be we'll, we'll be happier when indeed it's when you're in a blue zone it's much clearer that the journey is the destination that that you're enjoying every day and it's the sum of those enjoyable healthy j- days that create a you know a healthy age 100 not getting the book done and you know even though I've just written a book and it's doing very well I feel good about it but yeah. 
to be quite honest, I could have probably been optimizing my life better not writing the book. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I, what I, what I say about writers, anybody who tells me they love writing, I can, I can be pretty sure they're not a writer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh -huh. I, I love to have written. Yes. I don't like writing. Yeah. I hate writing. But I feel good to, you know, get it done. Yeah. I had to go to a, what I call a red zone, which is a hot spot of chaos to finish my book because in the the pacing of New York City and the urgency, I was able to push through and write that book in the timeline I was given. I then moved out of New York City shortly after because I was like, and at what cost? Remind our viewers or our listeners what the title of your book was. Mine, Addicted to Drama. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> Addicted to Drama. Healing the That's Dependency the... on Crisis and Chaos, yeah. Okay, I, I thought it might have been an epidemic around Broadway or something. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of is. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll walk over to your place later and hand you the book in a hot pl and bring you a hot plate. A good casserole. Yeah, hot dish. Hot, hot dish. dish. Oh, yeah, gosh, so I forgot it's hot casserole. dish. Is it hot with, plate in Wisconsin and hot dish? We're both from I Minnesota. Think, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, yeah. hot dish is always, it's got macaroni, cream of mushroom soup, almost always, some cheese in there. You know, if you're really special, like my ma did, she took the cheese whiz and the aerosol and plunged it in there and made cheese whiz nodules. So there was like little landmines of cheesy deliciousness. Wow. It's like a heart attack waiting to happen, but, you know, it was a delicious Minnesota <laughs> hot dish. That is that is how I used to describe Minnesota, actually, when I lived there. It was like, I just felt like I was in a heart attack waiting to happen. And then it was so interesting to see your work that you did specifically in Albert Lee, Minnesota. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. You did something significant there. You know, usually on the, the podcast, we have a section where we do, it's an advice column from a Midwestern mom. I, I feel like it's too close to home for both of us, so I opted not to do it this episode. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah I'd just tell you what my, my mom does, and that would be it. I do. I do. <laughs> so share with us a little bit more about like the, the Blue Zone crew project you did in Minnesota, because it's, it's, it's a pretty significant, I mean... It was inspiring, to say the least. Yeah, so this is back in 2009. I'd written the first Blue Zone book, and I'd been in the green room at Good Morning America and Oprah and CNN and seen all these sort of health gurus. And I'd kind of see, well, that that doesn't work. Uh, and I knew I'd just come back from these five amazing areas where people are manifestly living longer and healthy and fit and sharp. And I got to thinking, well, maybe I should try to manufacture a blue zone in America. And I lived in Minnesota at the time. The University of Minnesota partnered with me, School of Public Health. I wanted to make it a a, a real, real project. We got funding from AARP, about a million dollars. But it wasn't to do the typical thing. It wasn't to try to go in and convince them to eat their veggies or get more exercise which most of these sort of healthy city projects do, yeah. it was to reshape their environment. I brought in experts, policy experts, and f food environment experts, built environment experts, and, and we auditioned five cities here in Minnesota. And what, one of the things we learned is you don't show up to a city and bestow, we're going to make you a blue zone. By making them audition for it, you, you bring out their, first of all, they compete and you have to have the you have to have the support of the public sector, the mayor, the city council, and the private sector, the CEOs and the chamber of commerce. And it, it, you need both of them to kind of shake hands on this and say, "All right, we're going to go to work improving the environment here," which necessarily means you are making the healthy choice easy and cheaper, and you're making the unhealthy choice harder and more expensive. Hmm. And there are some out there who say, well, it sounds like nanny state to me. <laughs> that, that you're, you're taking our freedoms to eat pizza and burgers and French fries and Doritos away from us. And, and if you're that kind of city, 
you know, you called the wrong person. So we need to make sure that we're in a city that says, well, all right, you're right, 75% of us are obese or overweight. And, you know, there, 30% of us are diabetic or pre-diabetic. Yep, we're ready to try something new. And for that kind of city, we're, we're ready for you. And uh, Elbert Lee w- waved his hand and not only said, bring it on, but they also said, and we'll give you 125 volunteers and an office right next to the mayor. We got a lot done in a year and a half by going systematically, changing the restaurants and grocery stores and workplaces and adopting complete street policies, and which is walkability and bikeability, curbing junk food, junk food marketing, putting in a purpose workshops for about 25% of the population and getting them volunteering and optimizing their own homes so that they're mindlessly eating less and moving more. In about 18 months, we were able to raise the life expectancy by about three years, shave two tons off their waistline. By the way, this is a city of 18,000 people. And the city reported about a 30% drop in healthcare costs. And this was widely reported. It was in Newsweek magazine when there was still was a Newsweek magazine and USA Today and Good Morning America. And since then, we've been able to scale this to 72 other cities. And it's not because we go into these cities and we wag our fingers and say, you got to change the way you live or change your behavior. We simply reshape their living environment. So the healthy choice is the easiest cheapest and most salient. And that's and that is the big opportunity in America that we're missing. This show is also brought to you by the absolutely stunning and powerful tools of transformation that are created by Omala. Oof, even the name Omala transports you to a place of flow and vitality. These are some of my favorite products ever. They have an amazing color-changing yoga mat that responds to your temperature and presence and reflects back your posture in real time. There's this incredible smelling skin balm candle that heats up to activate all the essential oils and vitamins that your skin has been craving. I mean, look, if I could live in a giant bath of this candle, I would 100% do it. They also have these journals that lead you into profound insight. And then you get to plant those journals to create a stunning flower garden. What? I mean, if that's not deep and inventive, I don't know what is. If you're someone who desires to live a luxurious flow of life and who believes in transformative wellness, then you have to check out Humala. Omala is giving my listeners an exclusive discount to treat yourself to something that is as special as you, boo. All you have to do is go to omala.com, that's O-M-A-L-A.com, and use the code Dr. Scott 10 at checkout. And a portion of every purchase goes to an incredible charity. You got this. You know, it's funny, it's, uh, I shared with you earlier, I'm, I'm a psychologist, and, you know, what we learn so often in school, and it's still taught, it's ta- you know, that, that pathology comes from essentially a biochemical, and it just is like very systemic to the individual. And it, it, they so rarely, if ever, talk about the effect that we as humans are sponges, that even our self sense of self is absorbed from the ecosystem, from the environment. And to, to really recognize that the, the environment that is created or the ecosystem we live in has such a profound effect on not only our mental health, but our entire well-being. And now, as in your work, our longevity. I wrote a cover story for National Geographic on the secrets of happiness. Mm-hmm. 2018, I think it was... December of 2018, but it argued that the only dependable way to get happier is also to change your environment. These positive psychology uh, interventions like yeah. you know, gratitude, savoring, and journaling and so forth, great ideas. There's not a one of them where the tests lasted more than six months. Mm-hmm. And I know every one of them, as soon as you stop doing it, the effect goes away. You know, it's just like, 
you know, running marathons are probably pretty good for you. But the minute you stop running, then the effect goes away. Same thing with happiness. We know that if you live by water, as I do, I'm looking at water right now, controlling for everything else, you're about 10% happier. Yeah. We know that every new happy person you bring into your immediate social circle, your own happiness goes up by 15%. We know that if you're living in a walkable community, your happiness, and even a, a community that has access to healthy food, and community that has access to green spaces and recreation, every single one of those stack the deck in favor of happiness. So instead of telling you to go out and take this positive psychology class or sign up for a Tony Robbins seminar, I'm going to show you exactly what the data tells you on how what surroundings look like that unconsciously nudge you into the behaviors or into the situations that we know favor life satisfaction. And I don't know why it hasn't caught on more because there's a mountain of data and, and it works, but we don't think of it that way. Probably because marketers can't figure out how to sell that to you. Mm. It, to sell happiness in that without being in a bottle or without... Yeah, a... I mean, it's very hard to sell the notion of access to green space or access to walkability and make money at it. Mm. So mm -hmm. what, 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 what's at the top of our minds is the, is, the, is the, are the messages that are directly or subliminally marketed at it. I, I did the research on this. The, the average American has about 400 marketing message, messages rinsing over their psyche every single day. You get online and you get a pop-up. You start reading an article and every two paragraphs is another ad that, you know, you turn on the TV, there's commercials, nine commercials between segments. That And they're not selling us the, necessarily the things that lead to true happiness or longevity. They're selling us things that they can make money. Yeah. And, you know, most of it is a, a, a quick fix appeals to people, even though it's it doesn't work. You know, hope goes a long way and clever marketing goes a long way. Is is the places that you found have the happiest people in the world, are they also the places that are the blue zones? Not exactly. Yes, in one case. Costa okay. Rica. Costa Rica produces the happiest people per GDP dollar in the world. Mm. So they have the highest type of happiness known as affect. Yeah. Highest level of positive affect. And you know, the Koya Peninsula is also in Costa Rica. But all the blue zones are in the top 20% of the happiest places in the world. So there's an enormous overlap between the things that make us make it to 100 are also the things that make us enjoy the journey. The, probably mm -hmm. the most salient of which, and we've heard a lot of this from this, this big Harvard longevity study, you know, yeah. th that summation is the biggest thing you can do is have quality Relationships. social yeah. connections. Well, yeah. that is also the biggest thing you can do for happiness. Yeah. And we don't realize that. We, we don't realize that all this other crap that's marketing us, the best thing we can do is proactively go out and make three solid friends who care about us on a bad day. That's the mm -hmm. litmus test. Mm -hmm. Can I call this person when I'm down on my luck? and borrow a few bucks. Can I call this person and cry because my partner is being an asshole or just dump me and they'll care, they'll sit and listen or they just kind of slap on the back friends. It's also really important to have happy friends because that's contagious. Friends who aren't abusing drugs and alcohol, that's contagious. And even obesity is contagious. Hmm. I hate to say it, but if you're Three best friends are obese or overweight. There's about 150% better chance you'll be overweight. Hmm. So the best thing you can do for your happiness and your longevity, go out and proactively find at least two friends whose idea of recreation is pickleball or gardening or walking or golfing, not sitting around watching TV or bellied up to a bar bitching about work and, you know, eating chips. People who who it's not a bad idea to have a vegan or vegetarian in your immediate social network because they're going to teach you how to eat and where to find good 
whole food, plant-based. And then of course, people care about you on a bad day. And most Americans don't have that. And all the money and time and resources we spend on fad diets every new year or supplement programs or, or exercise programs, if we put that same exercise, it's not easy, but it's also not impossible to, to curate that immediate social circle. You mm. cannot go wrong. I, I think I just came up with your next book idea, Dan, which is like, how do we get those friends? It's like, it, I love the like clarity of that's the directionality, but in all reality, in, in, in this sort of transient and uh, social media focused culture, you know, where we're on screens as opposed to FaceTime, I, I hear it all the time. I've experienced it myself. It's harder and harder to meet the, those quality people. So solve it. <laughs> well, uh, okay, there's a couple. First, first of thing, it's yeah. not impossible. No. I met you. You met there's me. There's a path. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, I think technology, yeah. to the extent that it leads to real world connections, then we will mm. meet each other in Miami. Yeah. Um, we'll play pickleball. Oh, I'm in. <laughs> but one of the easiest ways is to volunteer. If mm. you love dogs and you volunteer for the Humane Society and uh, a volunteer to walk dogs, with, uh, you're going to meet other people who share your values, who share your passion. There's a notion in psychology known as homophily. We tend to like people who are like us. Mm -hmm. And there's no better place to find people like us than you know, people are volunteering. Maybe it's a homeless shelter. Maybe it's a soup kitchen. Hmm. Volunteering is uh, powerful. First of all, philanthropy is as uh, addictive as crack cocaine and sugar. It makes us feel good, mm -hmm. but it's a great place to build our social network. The other place, take the time to go through all your contacts. Hmm. You know, I, and I actually did this. I, yeah. I came back to Minnesota for part of the summer. And I, I went through and I thought, well, you know, who are the people I really like I'd like to reconnect with? And every, probably twice a week, they got a call from me and I invited them up back out for lunch. And out of that pack I invited out to lunch, I probably invited 10 people out. Three of them, now we're in regular contact again. Wow. Since we don't think that way because it's not marketed to us, but the yeah. research shows that's the best we can, I mean, the most powerful thing we can do for both our longevity yeah. and happiness. And I, I, I want to add here, you know, we all have unhealthy friends. And I'm not advocating that you dump your unhealthy friends because they probably need you. But I would say that you, you maybe lower the exposure mm -hmm. to, to really meaningful interactions. But you want to be spending most of your face-to-face -face time, and a lot of it, by the way, with people who have healthy contagions for you to pick up. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we know that uh, stress is one of the most contagious states there is evolutionarily designed to do that. And so it's, it's, it's so true that the people we are with the majority of the time is what we is, is the ecosystem we absorb. Yeah. Social ecosystem we absorb. I say our health behaviors are as contagious as catching a cold. <laughs> so we know it with drug abuse. We know it with Alcohol, if your friends all drink heavy, you're more likely to drink. If your friends are, are lonely, you're more likely to feel lonely. Think mm -hmm. about that for a second. You can mm -hmm. feel actually lonelier being with somebody than being alone. Unhappiness, contagious. It's all, you know, it's, so much of it is contagious. So who we hang out with, you know, I mean, it's probably a cliche by now. But I remember my grandmother says, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you're going to be. Mm. <laughs> That's a pretty powerful line. And, and now we might say, show us your friends and I'll tell you how long you'll live. That too. That's, yeah. that's another t-shirt. <laughs> uh, let's, let's make sure we get those t-shirts out for everyone. Merch, merch, merch. It's all about the merch. That's really why I have you on is just to get these little pockets of merch lines. I'm happy to you know, do my part. Yeah, towards capitalism. I appreciate that. All the good you're doing in the world, you got to add a little bit into the, the bad. Well, you know, I, I write these books and I keep it alive. And, which, by the way, the new one is Blue Zone Secrets of Living Longer. So speaking of merch, you know, it's a... <laughs> Don't you worry. I was going to name that book. We all I, have to sing for our supper. 
Scott. You know, at the end, there's not, there's yeah. no shame in that. And if, if 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 you can't probably promote the stuff that you produce, who's going yeah. to? Yeah, it's true. You know, I, I have to say, when you were talking about audition, the the auditions in Minnesota, I couldn't help but go back to like this idea of like, do you remember the TV show Glee? The or like the musical vaguely. vaguely. I didn't watch it, but I just I had this fantasy that you you had these five different towns sort of like musical like singing (laughs) sing-offs to determine who gets to be a blue zone. But I uh, that will be the next Netflix show, (laughs) the auditions to be a blue zone. You're welcome for all these ideas, by the way. Thank I don't need to be much. an executive yeah, I producer. I see a bunch of guys in like latex suits. In latex <laughs> suits. <laughs> oh, oh, the fun things we could do to make them audition. It's going to be a good one. I'd watch it for sure. I'm in. I, you know, by the way, volunteering is a beautiful, accessible answer. So again, thank you for that accessibility, that achievability towards moving towards this uh, longer happiness, longer life. I, I'm curious, and this might sound like a strange question. We're strange people, so it works. But can we ourselves be a blue zone? Does it have to just be a geographical ecosystem as opposed to this ecosystem we call human? I tend to think of what are the long-term changes we can make in our lives Mm -hmm. And if it's not long-term, it's not worth doing. There's nothing you can do this year that's going to make you live longer than 30 years, Mm -hmm. except not die. Uh, (laughs) I'll keep that in mind. So, you know, you can permanently change policy. You can permanently change streets. You can permanently, semi-permanently set up, design your kitchen so you'll eat less. Mm -hmm. When it comes to individuals, I think learning the skill of meditation it's like learning how to ride a bike. You never forget it. So I would see that's one way to blue zone ourselves. The other way to blue zone ourselves is to get clear on our sense of purpose. And when I say purpose, it's the confluence of our values, mm-hmm. what we like to do or our passions and what we're good at mm-hmm. and how those flow out into the world in a sort of service oriented way. That's purpose. And once you identify those three things that you're good at, you like to do, and that serve your values, those are, that's also something you never forget. And that becomes a ballast for when time get, times get difficult. It makes uh, decision-making very easy if you know your purpose. You don't, mm-hmm. you don't have to ponder. You, it's either fits or doesn't fit you. And it also guides your work life, working your purpose, like going to work every day if it's something that's purpose-driven, yeah, you can kind of turn off your brain and you're going to have less stress and you're going to do better in life and you're probably going to live longer. Eight years, as research suggests. So purpose and meditation, I think, are the two ways to blue zone your life. I I think in addition to my fantasy about the auditions to become a blue zone community, I also have this fantasy that those from a blue zone kind of migrate out or just mo- even temporarily, they go out, they, they come, they hang out with us in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, or Tallahassee, Florida, and, and they are agents of Blue Zonian-ness, or however you want to say it, but there is something also contagious about their being, about their embodied Blue Zone-ness, that I, I, I might be contagious in that way. I don't know. I don't, you know, I like... Lo- I don't think people in blue zones are, would necessarily be ambassadors because they don't even know. They don't do anything consciously. Yeah, yeah. They just live their lives. You know, yeah. I would I would actually say, you know, you're you're a blue zone ambassador, Scott. And uh, I think the message that your podcast puts out in the world, I think, you know, casts a sort of blue light on um, people's lives. And I salute you for it. And I, I, I've enjoyed talking to you here, and, and uh, I, let's, let's resolve to meet in Miami. I look forward to it, and thank you for being an ambassador of blue light in this world, my friend. All right. Uh, thank you so much for being on here. Scott, I'm sending a- you all a telephonic hug, and thank you. Everybody who took the time to listen here, I, I honor that. 
I appreciate it. I hope to see you in the real world someday. Look forward to it. Take care, my friend. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Gently Used Human podcast with Dr. Scott Lyons and friends. Visit GentlyUse.com for fun extras, including submitting your questions for advice from a Midwestern mom. And don't forget to spill the tea and gossip about the show with all your friends and frenemies. And you know what? Show us some love by giving us five stars and leaving a review in your favorite apps. This helps us connect with all the other gently used humans out there. Oh, and by the way, you look fierce today.